Well, good evening. Good evening. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. It's still Easter after all. In fact, every time, uh, Sundays in particular, but every time the church gathers for worship, it's always a celebration of the resurrection. So thanks be to God for that. Uh, tonight as we gather, of course, just a couple of brief announcements for you. Um, next Thursday is the often forgotten church festival of the Ascension. Uh, so next Thursday night we'll be celebrating the Ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ. We'll talk about exactly what that means and why it's so important. Um, and with celebrating that, there will also be our first Sundays on Thursdays, so our ice cream Sundays that we always do in the summer. So next Thursday, if you come on out, it's also Memorial Day weekend. Uh, so if you're here Thursday night, you're welcome to come celebrate the Ascension and end after service with some ice cream. Um, it's always a fantastic time. I always enjoy the summer Sundays on Thursday, so looking forward to that as well. Um, you'll see everything's coming up here, you know, confirmations on June 5th. Uh, so that's just a couple of weeks away. We just had our last uh, Sunday school uh, this past Sunday. So as we were starting to trans transition into the uh, summer schedule, uh, so what a joy that is as we, you know, kind of, for me, it's always kind of a time to retool and get focused again for the fall and all that's coming uh, with it. So uh, we look forward to that as well. Of course, Memorial Day is coming up. You'll see the office is closed on that Monday for Memorial Day and things like that. And if you have any other questions or comments, feel free to come and let me know uh, with all of that as well, the summer schedule and everything there. Uh, with that in mind tonight, as we gather before the throne of God, as we hear from his word, uh, we will be hearing about, we've been doing Revelation now, doing this Easter season, Easter season here with all the readings that go with it, and tonight we get the further fleshed out description of Christ's bride, his people, and the description that's used is very, um, it's, it's, it captivates your attention, uh, and we'll talk more about that as we get to it tonight. And also, we have a new member who will be professing his faith tonight, Matthew Klug. Did I say your last name right, Klug? All right. And his fiance Brooke Rollins, who's here with us. She's a member of our congregation. I've been working on new membership with him, and then together we're doing premarital well, with Pastor Andrew Wilson, and they're going to get married here. I, I promise you, I have the date written down, but remind me of the date. That's right, October 1st. So we're looking forward to that here in the coming months as well. So with that in mind, let's get to the meat and potatoes of why the Lord has assembled us tonight. Uh, so we can hear his word and receive his gifts. So let's first gather and give to him what's ours, our sins and our, our failures, and have him wipe those clean with his mercy and grace in Jesus Christ. Please stand as we begin our service this evening. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with our psalm this evening, which we say responsibly from Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad, and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity, 
and guide the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all the ends of the earth fear him. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. We sing now, this is the feast. Grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Congregation, please be seated as we hear from God's Word tonight. <coughs> Our first reading comes from the book of Acts, chapter 16. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, 
which is the leading city in the district of Macedonia, and a Roman colony. We remained there in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia, from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Christ has risen from the dead. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. Our second reading tonight comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, and also our sermon text tonight. Then came one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls full of the last seven plagues, and he spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and on the gates the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed on the east three gates. And on the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations. And on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. And I saw no temple. In the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of the sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it, and its gates will never be shut, for there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Out of reverence for Jesus Christ our Lord and for his gospel, we stand as we hear it and as we begin by singing the Alleluia. Truly, truly, I say to you, whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, that your joy may be full. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. And that day you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, 
Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has now come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation, be seated. And after you at this time, I'll invite you to come forward and present yourself before the altar. Dearly beloved in the Lord, this congregation, our Lord Jesus Christ said this to his apostles, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Matthew, you have been baptized and catechized in the Christian faith according to our Lord's bidding. Jesus said, Whoever confesses me before men, I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. So lift up your heart, therefore, to God, the God of all grace and joyfully give answer to what I now ask you in the name of the Lord. Do you this day, in the presence of God and of this congregation, acknowledge the gifts that God gave to you in your baptism, if so, answer by saying, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Do you renounce the devil? Yes, I renounce him. Do you renounce all his works? Yes, I renounce him. Do you renounce all his ways? Yes, I renounce them. Do you believe in God, the Father Almighty? Yes, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord? Yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Do you hold all the prophetic and apostolic scriptures to be the inspired word of God? I do. Do you confess the doctrine of the evangelical Lutheran church drawn from the scriptures as you have learned to know it from the small catechism to be faithful and true? I do. Do you intend to hear the word of God and to receive the Lord's Supper faithfully? Do you intend to live according to the word of God, and in faith, word, and deed, to remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? I do, by the grace of God. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this confession and church, and to suffer all, even death, rather than to fall away from it? I do, by the grace of God. Wonderful. We rejoice with thankful hearts that you have been baptized and have received the teachings of our Lord Jesus, you have confessed the faith. You've been absolved of all of your sins. So as you continue to hear the Lord's word and receive his blessed sacrament, know this, that he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Receive now this blessing. Feel free to kneel here at the rail. Matthew Klug, the almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and of the Spirit and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you in his grace into life everlasting. Amen. Please stand and we'll turn and we'll look at the altar here and pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your great goodness in bringing this, your Son, to the knowledge of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and enabling him both with the heart to believe and now with the mouth to confess your saving name. Grant that bringing forth the fruits of faith, he may continue steadfast and victorious to the day when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. Amen. I'll have you turn around here. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with Matthew. He's uh, an officer in the Marshfield Police Department. When did you start again? Three months ago, so he's just gotten fresh out of the academy, and now he's here in Marshfield, so it's been a joy and a, a privilege to work with him and his soon-to-be wife, Brooke, as well. So let us greet him as our dear brother in Jesus Christ.
And of course, I'll take this here. And as part of your day that, you know, becoming a member here and everything, we have a day of the remembrance of your confirmation here with us. And here's a certificate. It's wonderful. It goes through the six chief parts that we talked about in class and across for you as well. So thank you. It's a pleasure. And after service, I'll have you walk out with me and the congregation, you will get to greet him and welcome him as well. So feel free to head back to your seat. And we as the congregation, we will continue with our next, which I do believe is the hymn for today. It is hymn 673, Jerusalem, my happy home. My dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the, the husband of the wife, the church. Amen. Today, as we continue on, this is our fifth out of six. So next week, which actually we're talking about the Ascension next Thursday, so we'll conclude Revelation next Sunday. But we've been following long now for the last month or so in the book of Revelation, and tonight we pick it up again where we actually left off last week in chapter 21. If you wish to follow along in your pew Bibles, you are more than welcome to on page 1041. And as you flip there, if you're going to go there, I'll catch us up to speed. Last week, John, he got to, we're in the part of the book of Revelation now where we get to see a final vision of how things are going to be on the last day. He got to see a hint of the, the wife, the bride of the lamb. And today we get an even more fleshed out description of that. So as we pick it up today in verse 9, we come to this, uh, one of the angels, one of the seven angels who had one of the seven bowls of one of the last of the seven plagues comes forward to John. And, and this tells us, right, he, uh, this angel's purpose has been so far to pour out God's wrath on various sins and, and mires, but now there's, that's all over. 
is now in this part of the book of Revelation, there's no more wrath. Everything's been settled. The Satan, the satanic foes, those who do evil, they've all been dealt with. And now all that remains are those who belong to the Lamb, the wife of the Lamb. Now, throughout the book of Revelation, you could say the book of Revelation is a story of two women. One of the women, who's called the harlot, she's the one who is popular in the world. The world loves her, they adore her, they seek her, they seek her riches, but yet her ways lead to death, which sounds a lot like the book of Proverbs. And there's another woman, she's often rejected, scorned, thrown out, persecuted. She doesn't look like much to the world, but she's the bride of the Lamb. And throughout much of the book of Revelation, she's hounded, but yet God protects her and keeps her safe until finally we come to this last vision of how things are. So the angel comes forward to John and says, hey, let me show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Now, when we confess the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed, which we'll do after the sermon tonight, we always get to the part in there where we say, I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church And always, it's always been commented on that this is an article of faith. Because if you look at the church, she looks far from holy at times. But that's how we see things. God, on the other hand, sees things differently. He sees things through the lens of his son. He sees things through how Jesus Christ has taken care of you and me. So John, he gets to be seeing this lamb. He gets to see things as God sees us. And so we're told in verse 10 that he gets carried away, right, in the spirit And we're told he gets brought to a very great high mountain. And what does he see? He's shown the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. We heard this last week. The very same image was given as the holy city of Jerusalem was descending out of heaven from God like a bride adorned for her husband, we were told in verse tw- uh, chapter 21 in those opening verses. Here we get the same thing. And remember, when we talk about Jerusalem in Revelation, or even in the New Testament, What we're talking about here are the people of God. We're not talking about the actual city that's half a world away. We're talking about God's people who dwell there, because that's kind of shorthand for God's people. So he sees the holy people of God coming down out of heaven, this great multitude that we had talked about in chapter 7. And what does he see? Much like in that vision when we got the image of the white robes of palm branches in their hand, we see that these people, this holy city, has the glory of God upon her. Now what's cool about this is that we're on a high mountain, and for John, this brings back the image of the mountain of transfiguration. Remember when John goes up and Jesus takes him up, and he's transfigured, and he looks brilliant and white as snow, and it freaks John, Peter, James, and John out. Here, we're on a similar mountain of transfiguration, and this time it's not Jesus who's transfigured, but his people. You can remember Moses in the Old Testament when he goes up on Mount Sinai and he comes back down. The people can't even look at Moses. Why? Because his face is glowing because he's been in the presence of God. Here, it's the same thing. The glory of God is upon her. It's a radiance like a most rare jewel. Jasper, it's clear as crystal. Now, in the Old Testament, God would, two or three times, actually, it's very rare, God says that his people are his treasured possession. And here we get this in spades. We get to see what this looks like. Right? God's people looking glorious and beautiful. And we're told that this city coming down has a great high wall with 12 gates. Right? Easy. There's access all around in the church. Right? And a wall. Why in the world does the church need a wall? Right? When there's no evil to threaten her, why does she need a wall? Because it brings to mind protection. It brings to mind this is a safe place. It brings to mind that this is where God is with his people. And of course, we get the number 12. You're going to hear that, I think, almost, maybe almost a dozen times here. You get the 12 gates. There's 12 angels. There's the 12 tribes inscribed. There's the 12 foundations with the 12 apostles of the the Lamb. It's all a number for the church, right? See, John here, he's making very explicit, saying it multiple times that you and I grasp it. What John is seeing here is the church. You and I included in there. And so he sees in there, on the gates, there are posted angels, right, those who protect, and on the gates are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel, right? It's all the Old Testament people of God, right? Who's there? There's Abraham, there's there's Isaac, there's Noah, right? There's, There's Rachel, there's Leah, there's all of them are there. You go through the Old Testament, they're included here too. 
and the gates and the walls had the Old Testament names, but what it's built on, the 12 foundations that it's on, is the 12 foundations of the Lamb, right? The apostles. The church is built upon the foundation of the apostles, Paul writes. Their message, their, the faith that they have transferred to us, that's what we build this city on, that grounded faith that we will confess here after the sermon. And on there are the 12... Excuse me, the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So there's a New Testament church too. So this is all the people of God from all time, from all space that John is getting to see here that he's using, describing them as a building. In fact, he's describing them as the temple, right? Which Peter will do that. You are holy stones being built up into a temple of God. Well, then in our text, if you're following along in the Bible, you'll notice actually our lesson for tonight skips several verses, and it's kind of a shame that they skip them, but we'll briefly cover them. If you look at verses 15 through 20, there's a description of the church. There's a measuring rod that's used to measure the city. It's expansive, it's big, it's huge, right, because there's enough space for everyone in there that's there, right? And at the end of it, we get, there's 12 stones that are inscribed on the city, right? And there's different ones. There's the jasper, the sapphire, the agates, the emerald, the onyx, carnelian, all of these stones. And you're sitting there like, why are we talking about 12 stones? Because in the Bible, this is the description of the high priest. In the Old Testament, when they're making the clothes of the high priest, we're told the high priest had a kind of a chest garment on, and on it there's a plate. And in the plate, there were 12 stones, and each stone represented one of the tribes of Israel. So when the high priest went into God's presence, God would see the high priest and go, ah, there's my people Israel. The high priest stands for all of them there. And so here, John's using this description to call to mind who we are. We're God's priest. We stand before him now. We represent him to the creation, which then leads us to the back half of our lesson tonight in verse 21. We're told that, a further description of the city, that there are 12 gates and there are 12 pearls. Each of the gates is made of a single pearl. That's a lot of beauty. The streets paved with gold, right? You hear that, the early descriptions of America, right? What are the immigrants here? That the streets are paved with gold, right? This is the language they're picking up from Revelation. The final city of God, and it's beautiful. It tells us that this city, it's not like any other city, and it comes at a great cost to enter into this city, which we find out, how do you get in? Hold on to that thought, because it's the last verse for our lesson tonight. Well, then John continues in verse 22. He says that there's no temple in this city. It's odd. Every city has a temple or a church, but we're told here that the temple is the Lord God himself, who is the Almighty and the Lamb, right? God himself will dwell with us. He will be with his people, and we will be, he will be our God, and we will be his people. And so here we see that we won't need a building to commemorate because the Lord Jesus Christ will be walking among us, and we won't need to have any building for him to be in. We're told that the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it because it doesn't need any other light besides that of the land. Now, this is not saying in the new creation there won't be a sun or a moon but that we won't need them for guidance because we will have God, the one who is the author of light. We're told that the glory of God gives that city its light. The word of God, Psalm 119, 105, right? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Right? It's God's word which will show us the direction and the way to go in life. Right? And it's a reminder in Genesis chapter 1 that before there was a sun or a moon, God had made light because light isn't dependent on the sun. Light is dependent upon God giving it. And so John here is quick to point that out and remind us that light comes from God, not anywhere else. And then he has a word play here because in verse 24, he says, by its light, the light of the Lamb, the nations will walk. You see, when we talk about God's word, oftentimes it's used as the path in which we walk, the path in which we live life itself. And so by it, the nations will walk, that the nations here are standing in for the Gentiles. Now in the Bible, the Gentiles are described as dark. They don't know the way because they don't know God. Here, they will know God. They will follow him and they will know how the way to live because God will have made himself known to them. And then we're told, this is some of my favorite verses in the Bible, that the kings of the earth will bring their glory 
into the city. And we'll flesh this out in a second, and we'll talk about exactly what this means. But as a little starter, what we're bringing into this city, right? You have a house, you have a building, what do you put into it? When I first moved into our house, right, it was a bare house. We had to bring in the furniture, the pictures, you name it. We had to decorate the house. John here is going to go about how we are decorating the new creation. We're told that its gates are never going to be shut by day. They'll never be shut by day. And guess what? There's no night there. So the gates will always be open into this city because there's no more fear. There's no more need to keep out anything because there's nothing to, needing to be kept out. And then we're told in verse 26 that they will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. You see, part of what we're going to decorate the new creation with is our culture, our language, our literature, our movies, our media, our language, our food recipes, you name it. It's all going to decorate the new creation. What we're doing as part of the church is going out into the world, and we're kind of, not just kind of, we are, we are collecting cultures. It's just like Noah's Ark. When Noah was preparing for the flood, he brought in two of every kind of creature. He's collecting animals to save. And we're told he also brings in the food and the seeds so that after the flood, there would be stuff to plant and to grow again. Here, the church's job is to go out and we go to Greek and we'll say, we'll take that. We'll go to different cultures and say, that's ours now. Because the church's job is to collect what's the best of the world and bring it into its culture, right? This is the job because this is what's going to be brought into the new creation, the best of what our world, what we have made, we too will bring into the new creation. So, do your jobs really well. Build things, right? Construct things, cook things, because those are the things that we will be dragging in with us into the new creation. That is our glory, that is our honor that we get to decorate the new creation with. And then we're told, but nothing unclean will ever enter it nor anyone who does anything detestable or false, right? The, the, the wicked parts of our culture, the bad things, the sins, those things will not make it in, but those things which are beautiful and noble and good and true and right, that'll be what we bring into the new creation. So all this brings up then in John's mind here, right? This city is very costly to enter into. How does one enter into this city? How does one pay the fee, one might say? But we're told in the very end of that verse, in verse 27, the only thing that's going to enter into the city are those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. You see, this book is what determines who comes in. Now, of course, this book in the scriptures, right, we're told at the judgment day all the books are open and everyone will be judged by in them, but only those who come in are those who the Lamb has written in his book. So the question becomes for you and me, are you and I in it? Well, thanks be to God. That's the job of me tonight. You're in. You belong in God's kingdom. He's going to sign it here with this meal, right? This is how you know that your name is written in the book of life, right? This is judgment day happening tonight, right? You're finding out God's decision about what he's going to do with you here in this meal. And so because of that promise, we're grasping onto it, and we're waiting a day. And in the meantime, while we wait for this day to come, we're out there doing the jobs that God gave us to do, whether it be a husband or father or, you know, a child or a brother or a spouse or a worker, whatever the case may be where God has put you, do your job well, because you'll have a part to play in bringing in those things into the new creation. Just as Noah did the ark, so too it will be for us on that last day. So go out there, collect the things of this world and bring them in. A final note on this, because I don't want to forget it. The church has always done this. If you look in our hymnal, if you look at our music in particular, you'll notice that our music comes from all times and places, right? There's stuff in there from 1,500 years ago. There's stuff in there from Cuba, in fact. There's stuff in there from South Africa, from Asia, right? Right now, as part of the church, we're collecting things, and we're going to bring them and present them before our God on the last day, and he will welcome them into the city because he has washed them clean in the Lamb's book of life. And that includes you, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. So may that be your hope as we push forward now in these last days that you will look forward to this moment when God will enter us into his shouts and with joys as we come into the new creation and we begin life there. But in the meantime, hold on and hold on to his promises. God grant that for Jesus' sake, dear church. Amen. Let us now...
confess our faith and who God is and what he has done for us by speaking the Apostles' Creed. Please stand as we confess that faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us go before our God this evening in prayer, imploring him for the sake of his Son, Jesus Christ, to hear us and answer us. We continue now with our prayers. Dear Father in heaven, we ask that you would look upon us, your children, your dear bride here on earth, and grant us grace that your holy name would be kept holy by us and in all the world through the pure and true teaching of your word and in the fervent love shown forth in our lives. Graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy. Strengthen us by your Spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of both good and evil things, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Dear Father, in this night we especially lift before you those in our congregation, those who have asked for our prayers, and we turn them to you. For Mary. Lord, in your mercy. And Lord, we lift up to you our government, those who would serve and protect us and our armed forces, those who work in our behalf, those who work in our police departments, our firefighters, our EMS, those who respond to emergencies, for doctors, nurses, for those in our schools as teachers wrap up another year of learning and of education, that students would be blessed and that they would be continue to apply their minds to the study of your word and to the care of our world, knowing that they will bring in those fruits on the last day. Lord, in your mercy. We ask you to be with all the women, those who are pregnant, those who seek to become pregnant. We ask you to bless and keep them always. Lord, in your mercy. Give us this day our daily bread. Preserve us from greed and from selfish cares. And help us to trust in you to provide for all of our needs. Lord, in your mercy. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us, so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy. Lead us not into temptation, O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy. And finally, Father, deliver us from all evil of body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ our Lord. In his name we pray. Amen. We now at this time will bring forward our offerings that we have collected this night and bring them before our Lord. And as we also sing the offertory, congregation, I'll have you be seated as we do so.
and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. We sing as our final song this evening, hymn 490, Jesus Lives, the Victory's Won. <laughs> 